Hello YouTube, uh, so we're going to continue uh, looking at disease, what exactly is disease. Um, now last time we looked at Christopher Bourse's biostatistical theory, that was a, a purely kind of naturalistic, a purely empirical theory of disease. We also saw Nordenfeldt's uh, more value-laden approach, a holistic approach. Um, so uh, today we're going to look at a, a rather more extreme value-laden approach, and this is social constructivism. Now it's notoriously difficult to give a precise characterization of social constructivism, but the basic idea, uh, at least in this context, is that it's up to us, it's up to society whether or not something counts as disease. Something is a disease if we choose to class it as a disease. Uh, in particular, a disease doesn't necessarily involve malfunction or even harm. Diseases are states that we judge to be bad or unusual or abnormal in some way. They are states that violate our conventions about what humans should be like. So maybe you could compare this to something like art. Consider all of the things that we might uh, class as art. Um, you know, sculptures and uh, paintings and uh, certain kinds of avant-garde performances and, and all this stuff. What makes something art? Well, plausibly... Whether or not something is an artwork is, is just kind of up to us. Uh, it's not a fact in the world to be discovered. Instead, we decide what counts as art as a society. Art arises out of so certain conventions and institutions and practices. So in the same way, then, uh, disease isn't something that can be found by scientific investigation. It's determined by social practices. One recent example of constructivism is uh, in the article Tolerance and Illness by Shane Glackin. Uh, Glackin talks about disability, and he notes that disability is always relative to social standards and social expectations. So, I mean, you know, why is the inability to walk a disability, while the inability to fly isn't? Well, because the inability to walk is required in society whereas nobody requires the inability to fly. But the requirements of society can change. Um, who knows what kinds of technological developments might come in the future. Maybe there will be a time when flying is as normal as walking. For maybe a more convincing example along these lines, Glackin considers the deaf community. In the 1980s, cochlear implants were developed. The, those these uh, uh, electronic gadgets that are fitted into the ear and allow people who are completely deaf to regain a sense of sound. So that seems like a fairly straightforward medical breakthrough. It has the potential to liberate millions of deaf people. But cochlear implants were actually uh, met with a great deal of resistance. Um, many deaf people considered them to be something of a threat. The problem is that deafness was central to many people's identities and there had kind of developed a, a sort of robust community of deaf people. Uh, as Glacken says, the deaf community has its own language, its own literature, it has specialised organisations and its own political concerns. And people who were part of the deaf community felt that these implants would erode this, uh, this achievement, this whole way of life that they'd built up. In particular, they argued that in the context of, this, of the deaf community, deafness just isn't a disability. In the deaf community, deafness doesn't cause any problems with communication. It doesn't negatively interfere with anybody's life. The inability to hear becomes just like the inability to fly. It becomes normalised and the community is just structured around the assumption that this isn't an ability that people have. Um, so many people objected to the idea of curing deafness. Uh, this was seen as sort of at best insulting and at worst a kind of uh, cultural imperialism. If we cure deafness, this will obliterate the deaf community. But isn't that a bit like forcing tribal peoples to assimilate to modern civilization? I mean, there's obviously a lot of debate about this, but most people would probably agree that we have uh, we should have some sort of respect for other ways of life. Um, it, it, you know, it would probably be a bad thing if everybody in the world had the same culture, spoke the same language. So we have to give um, you know, tribal people room to continue their own development. Um, I mean, the, the sort of ethics of, of that is a, obviously a very big question. You know, how should we accommodate different cultures and so on? But the point is, it's quite plausible to think 
that something like deafness really only counts as a disability because of the particular conditions of our society. There's nothing um, biological about it, it's, it's just a, a matter of social standards and social expectations. So Glacken makes a general claim. He says that all judgments of medical or psychiatric dysfunction reflect our collective willingness or reluctance to tolerate and or accommodate the medical or psychiatric conditions in question. When we class something as a disease, this involves making an evaluative judgment and it's connected to social institutions and social practices. If we change our attitudes, if, if we alter the social organisation, a state that counts as a disease may become perfectly healthy. Um, and this is just how deafness is obviously a disease in, in uh, sort of our normal society since it disables people. But it doesn't really require very big changes of social organisation to make a state of deafness perfectly healthy. Um, so another kind of a very different sort of argument for constructivism is provided by research on the conflation of health and beauty. Uh, I'm not so much so familiar with uh, much work on this, but there's an article by uh, Sophia F. Uh, F. Sophia F. Stathio, I believe, uh, called Blue "Beauty and Health as Medical Norms," and um, I'll just quote her at length. So she says, uh, "Consider the covers of magazines devoted to healthy living. Such publications present models of health that are rarely unattractive." seemingly implying that securing health is tantamount to a particular beautiful look. The popular media are not the only ones to identify health and beauty. Various conditions are, cla are classed as medical disorders for purely cosmetic reasons. For example, birthmarks, hair loss or common psoriasis. Conversely, descriptors of health often equivocate between saying that an organism is beautiful and healthy. For example, when we talk about an animal's glossy coat or bright eyes. Um, of course, the point for this video is that, as they say, uh, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. There aren't facts about beauty. You can't determine what's beautiful through scientific investigation, or so at least a plausible view would, would, would say. So if our concept of health is connected, necessarily connected to the concept of beauty, and, and disease is connected to ugliness, that would seem to suggest that health and disease are more like art than like gravity or mass. Uh, similarly, you might want to um, look at sort of um, the uh, attitudes towards things like uh, hermaphrodites, hermaphroditism uh, and intersex sort of conditions. Um, is that unhealthy or is it merely, you know, is, that a, is that a kind of disease or is it just um, unusual? Uh, I think that very plausibly it's it could it could be sort of it's treated as a disease very often and throughout history it's often been treated as a disease very very arguably though it's it's just a kind of um, different sort of body um, so lots of interesting things to think about there okay uh, one problem with constructivism is what Glacking calls easy cases so things like heart attacks cancer Huntington's disease I mean perhaps social constructivism works with uh, things like deafness but I mean, surely cancer is just a disease. Uh, deafness is a plausible example for constructivism because people can live very robust and fulfilling lives without deafness interfering. But how could that be the case for cancer? Um, I mean, with deafness, we can restructure society so that it stops being a problem. Deaf communities have developed their own sorts of languages and practices and, that, and have normalised deafness. By changing the social organisation, you remove the problems that deafness causes. But what possible social changes could we make to, to make living with cancer OK? So, I mean, the basic response to this problem is, well, look, these, the, the, the easy cases are easy just because we all agree on them, right? I mean, that's what makes them easy. Nobody wants to have cancer. Nobody wants to have a heart attack. This doesn't mean that it's not socially constructed. It just means that... Um, you know, it, it just means that people happen to agree. And so I guess it's sort of like the, the uh, it, you know, something like, why do we not, um, do we not like dog feces? I mean, presumably it's not a fact in the world that uh, dog feces is bad. I believe that flies seem to like it very much. Um, but, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's just an easy case. It's just, it's, it's not good for us. Um, so, 
similarly, there are just sort of cases which are, are these easy cases. We just all agree on them. Um, just because everybody happens to agree doesn't make it uh, an objective fact. Um, it's, it's still socially constructed, but, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's easier. That's all. Another point that we might make here that's kind of worth bearing in mind is that uh, this objection is possibly based on just a failure of imagination. Because, in, in fact, we kind of can imagine altering social conditions so that even something like cancer ends up plausibly not being a disease. So imagine a society um, who accept a, a sort of tribal polytheism. They accept all sorts of gods, uh, a rain god, a sun god, god of life, god of death, all that stuff. And they think that they must appease these gods by making sacrifices. It's a fairly familiar kind of belief system. The Aztecs believed something like it. Furthermore, they believe that people who have rapidly growing tumours are the chosen ones. They've been selected by the gods as a sacrifice. Indeed, the tumour is believed to be a sign of the gods. People who have uh, rapidly growing tumours are considered to be healthy and they are to be treated like royalty until they die. Uh, furthermore, since people with tumours are connected to the gods, it's believed that they have special gifts. They are specially placed to communicate with the gods, so they end up becoming sort of like shamans. Um, I mean, there are many ways we can develop this. Uh, you get the picture, right? Now, the question is, in this imaginary society, would cancer be a disease? Well, I mean, I must say that my intuition is, is still to say, yes, cancer is a disease, but it seems, I mean, it's at least plausible to say that this is like the case of deafness. Given the way that this society treats cancer, it would be wrong to class it as a disease. And so actually that's entirely compatible with the social constructivist view. Um, so maybe maybe we could just say, look, you know, you've just got to imagine things better. Um, it, 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 would make, it would take far more radical changes of our social attitudes to make cancer uh, a perfectly healthy state but it, it could be done. Um, it is possible. Okay, uh, a second objection is that we often judge that somebody is in a bad state without judging that they are diseased. So the social constructivist says that classifying somebody as diseased simply involves making certain kinds of evaluative judgments about them. Recall uh, Glackin's general claim, uh, all judgments of medical or psychiatric dysfunction reflect our collective willingness to or reluctance to tolerate and or accommodate the medical or psychiatric conditions in question. But now in this case, how do we uh, explain the distinction between states that are diseases and states that are merely bad? So consider the debates about whether or not addiction counts as a disease. We all agree that addiction is bad, so the judgment that it's a disease must involve something more than this. Um, or it must be a special kind of evaluative judgment. Another example is unwanted pregnancy. Unwanted pregnancies are bad, but it seems very odd to consider them diseases. Or what about ugliness? Uh, just, just looking ugly, having a face that puts people off, it's not a good thing, but it's, it's not in itself a disease. Um, you know, I mean, we did, uh, I, I did mention the, the research on the conflation of health and beauty, but uh, we don't consider somebody diseased just because they are ugly. Uh, you can come up with your own examples here. There are all sorts of, of states that we judge negatively um, without judging that they are diseases. So uh, one main response to this problem is that whether or not an undesirable state is a disease depends on who treats it. It depends on the uh, division of labour, as it were, in the society in question. If the bad state in question is dealt with by the medical industry, then it counts as a disease. Uh, so what we do is look at hospitals, pharmacies, doctors, and we just ask, what do they treat? To return to the art analogy, if somebody asks what art is, one response we might give is just to point to art galleries and museums and say, well, art is the stuff that they're doing. So with addiction, the question is, is the addiction dealt with by the medical industry? If so, it's a disease. If not, it's not a disease. And of course, this will be different in different societies. Um, so in some places, addiction will be a disease. In some places, it won't be a disease. Uh, but that's obviously pretty much the, the whole point of the social constructivist approach. Now, there is uh, a worry about this response. How do we determine what counts as the medical industry? How do we determine what counts there? Uh, I mean, consider plastic surgery. Plastic surgeons do treat diseases, but they will also perform 
purely cosmetic operations, uh, perhaps to increase breast size or to alter somebody's nose. Um, if plastic surgery counts as part of the medical industry, then since plastic surgeons will treat things like small breasts, it looks like the social constructivist have to, has to say that small breasts are a disease for some people. Um, if you have small breasts and you want bigger ones, then the small breasts are a disease. Um, similarly, consider unwanted pregnancies again. Unwanted pregnancies are treated through abortions. Abortions are provided by doctors and are considered to be medical procedures. Again, it looks like we have to say that unwanted pregnancies are diseases. So, um, so I think this is uh, a more a more serious problem and is not not solved uh, so easily. A third difficulty is similar to a problem we raised for Bourse's biostatistical theory. The social constructivist view seems to force us to accept that certain conditions are diseases when we, we really might not want to say this. So take homosexuality. In the past, homosexuality was considered to be a disease and various treatments for it were proposed. Uh, in fact, even today, in some of the more religious areas of the US, for instance, homosexuality is seen as something that requires uh, medical treatment. Um, I mean, obviously it's treatment that doesn't work, it's not really accepted by uh, standard medical practitioners, but there are certainly places in the US that treat it as a medical problem. Um, so if we accept social constructivism, um, it looks like we have to say, well, yeah, homosexuality is a, a disease in these cases. If you live in, in a society that treats homosexuality as a disease, and you're a homosexual, then you're diseased. Um, so, I mean, I guess the, the real worry here is that constructivism just gives too much power to, to the social judgments. Um, you know, it, it, there are cases where I think we would want to say, well, even if people consider something a disease, it's, it's actually not, right? I mean, homosexuality just isn't a disease, but um, it's really not clear that the social constructivist can allow this. Okay, so that's sort of basic social constructivism, um, but we can actually take constructivist views a bit further. So an assumption that we've been making so far throughout uh, the, these last couple of videos is that in is that describing bodily states is is simple biology. So so the norms, the the, the question of social construction, that only enters the picture when we uh, when we classify certain states as diseased or healthy. But we can provide a state description of an organism, and that's just that's straightforward biology. So, so in some cases, this is obviously fine, right? I mean, a heart attack is a heart attack, a stroke is a stroke. But other cases are a bit more complex and um, maybe suggest ways of, of extending the constructivist argument. Consider tuberculosis, uh, an example suggested by Jeremy Simon. What the constructivist might say here uh, is that nothing in nature forces us to recognise tuberculosis as a condition. Uh, rather, physicians and biologists have found over many decades of practice that it's, it's useful to view people who are infected with a certain bacterium and who exhibit certain symptoms as a homogenous group. We classify these patients as having tuberculosis because doing so is what best allows us to treat them and to help them live longer. But this is really a, a sort of contingent matter based on what we happen to have discovered and how treatments happen to have developed. So to quote Simon, if we had more effective treatments for immune deficiency, which generally accompanies active tuberculosis, and perhaps no anti-tuberculosis medications, we might not recognize tuberculosis as a, as a condition, but rather fold most cases of what we now recognize as tuberculosis into a different condition uh, of immunodeficiency. So, so an important thing to bear in mind here is that there's a distinction between the infection and the disease. Infections cause diseases, they're not identical with diseases. It's a straightforward biological matter whether or not you're infected with mycobacterium tuberculosis. That's not socially constructed. But what we might suggest is socially constructed uh, is the claim that mycobacterium tuberculosis causes the condition tuberculosis rather than some other condition. So these days we recognise a condition called tuberculosis. What Simon suggests here is that classifying people as having tuberculosis isn't just a biological matter. It reflects contingent facts about how medical practice happened to develop and how we find it easier to classify things.
Another example uh, along the same lines is HIV AIDS. Uh, whether or not you're infected with HIV is a simple uh, objective fact. Whether you have AIDS is um, rather less, is rather more difficult. Um, so HIV is a, a retrovirus that infects cells in the human immune system. AIDS is a condition, a syndrome, that, is, that can be caused by HIV infection. Now there are basically two ways that AIDS is diagnosed. First, um, it can be diagnosed by the occurrence of other diseases with the HIV infection. So if you have HIV plus other diseases like pneumocystitis, pneumonia, esophageal thrush, um, cancers like Kaposi's sarcoma and so on, then you have AIDS. The second, it can be diagnosed by what's known as a CD4 count, by the number of T cells expressing the CD4 protein. So CD4 positive T cells are helper cells that facilitate communication between other cells of the immune system. Um, if you have uh, an HIV in infects these and it reduces the, the CD4 count. Now if you have HIV and the number of T cells expressing CD4 is under 200 per cubic millimeter of blood, then you have AIDS. Okay, now there are two points to draw attention to here. First of all, notice that these methods of diagnosis are highly disparate. The first is based on, on sort of general infections and diseases that the patient has. The second has to be done through testing for a, num for, a, for a number of a certain kind of immune cell. So there doesn't sort of, at least initially, seem to be much relation between these two things. And bear in mind, this isn't just how AIDS is diagnosed, it's how AIDS is defined. By definition, you have AIDS if either of these two things is the case. You know, if you have HIV plus these other infections, or if you have HIV and a low CD4 count. So the syndrome, the syndrome AIDS, the condition AIDS, starts to look like uh, a sort of collection of perhaps quite discrete biological processes. Why do we group them together? A second thing to note is that HIV isn't the only thing that can cause AIDS-related diseases, nor is it the only thing that can cause lower CD4 counts. Both of these things can also be caused by the condition lymphocytopenia, for instance. Now, suppose you have lymphocytopenia, and this has caused your CD4 count to drop below 200. You then contract HIV, while you now immediately have AIDS, just by definition, um, before the HIV has even started to do any, any real damage. You know, it might still be in the latency phase, but because you have HIV and you have a low CD4 count, you have AIDS. So you might think that, that all of this supports a, uh, a social constructivist view. HIV is uh, a matter of biology. It does a variety of things. AIDS is a condition, a syndrome. It's not an infection. It's a condition that's caused by an infection. Uh, the classification AIDS doesn't simply describe biological facts. It's useful to group certain people together and exclude certain others. Uh, when, we, when we treat AIDS, what we ultimately treat is the HIV infection. The drugs that we give people with AIDS are antiretrovirals. They, they specifically target the HIV virus. Somebody who has lymphocytopenia with a very low CD4 count will be in a condition that, biologically speaking, is the same as AIDS. But because we can identify different causes and um, it, because it's helpful to use different treatments, we don't classify it. We don't classify them as the same. So I suppose, you, imagine uh, that uh, um, if instead of using drugs that targeted HIV infection, we instead had come up with some sort of uh, drug that directly increased CD4 positive T cells. Well, in that case, we might use exactly the same treatment for AIDS and for lymphocytopenia. We might be less inclined to class them as separate conditions. Suppose also that, uh, uh, say, HIV hadn't had the, the kind of major social consequences that it did. Imagine it was um, a very... Uh, sort of minor kind of esoteric uh, inf infection, very rare sort of infection, again, then we might be less inclined to sort of view AIDS as a uh, kind of separate condition, as a uh, sort of condition all of, it, all of its own. We might sort of just um, kind of class it with various other conditions instead. So, um, so the idea here is, I mean, the, the general point here is um, that it's not just... Uh, uh, the, 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 the sort of classifications of health and disease, right? That's not the only thing that's a matter of social construction. We also construct the conditions themselves, right? So the question, is AIDS a disease? It's, that's not the only thing that's socially constructed. AIDS itself is socially constructed. 
or, or so these sorts of considerations may suggest. Uh, obviously very controversial, um, lots to debate there, so mm -hmm. I'll, uh, I'll leave you to think about that. Um, right. Okay, finally, um, I want to look at disease eliminativism. Um, very interesting paper by, I believe his name is pronounced, German Heslow, suggests that maybe this whole debate is, um, is sort of just misguided. Uh, Heslow argues that we don't really need a concept of disease. Um, it's, it's irrelevant to medical practice. We don't need to spend any time analysing it. Heslow thinks basically uh, we could just do away with the concept of disease. But certainly he argues that philosophers are, are wasting their time getting into all of these uh, kind of complex... Uh, arguments about what exactly counts as a disease, he thinks we should just um, forget about that and just, just drop the whole project. So he, he considers a few reasons why we might think we need a concept of disease. Um, you know, what, what sort of justification is there for bothering with uh, analysing the notion of disease? Well, one option is to say uh, that disease is the, the, the kind of basic ground for medical treatment. Uh, on an individual level, the diagnosis of disease is what justifies medical intervention. So physicians will treat something because it's a disease. More generally, the whole purpose of medicine, the whole point of medicine, is to fight against disease. Um, I mean, that, that almost sounds trivial. We have a concept, you know, we have a concept of disease because disease is the central target of medical practice. So there are a couple of problems here. Um, the first point, which Heslow doesn't mention, but I think is worth noting, is that this argument could have the causation the wrong way round, right? So considering some of the points raised regarding social constructivism, it could simply be that whatever is treated medically is by definition classed as a disease, rather than there being sort of independent disease states which medicine then focuses on. Yeah, so, so the reason disease and medicine are linked isn't that medicine discovers and then treats diseases, it's that Medicine treats all, all various different kinds of states, and these are just, by definition, classed as disease because they're treated by medicine. So, you know, it, it could be that the, that the causation is the wrong way around in, in this argument. But, but more importantly, actually, Haslow says, look, even this claim that medicine treats disease, actually, that's just not true. Um, he points out that actually uh, healthy conditions um, can be be altered medically. Uh, again, we already pointed out cosmetic surgery, like uh, breast augmentation, similarly treatments for male baldness. That's not a disease, but it's treated, can be treated by medicine. Uh, then there's medicine that's designed not simply to make people healthy, but to produce uh, sort of super normal functions, as you might find in sports medicine. Um, some of the, in fact, some of the things that athletes do might actually be making them unhealthy overall. Think about athletes taking performance enhancing drugs, but the, the point is to just to improve a specific, a specific function. It's to, to make a certain function better, make them run faster, make them be able to um, you know, stay at a uh, sort of enhanced state for longer. Um, then there's a the life extension movement. So the life extension movement isn't about combating disease so much. It's about radically improving health. It's about improving health beyond the mere absence of disease. Um, allowing people to live for maybe hundreds of years. So it's not disease that matters in medicine. What matters is that some intervention may be considered beneficial and the physician has the ability to help. Um, the second suggestion is that disease determines whether the cost of the condition is borne by the individual or the state. Or in places like America, disease determines whether the cost is borne by the individual or the insurance company. Um, I think Obama has improved things somewhat in America, but it still doesn't have a, like a proper healthcare system, does it? Um, but in, in countries that are sort of developed and civilised and, you know, take care of their citizens properly, um, you know, the government actually does its job in some countries, uh, the cost of disease will be borne by the state, or at least it can be. If you haven't got enough money to pay for your own healthcare, the state will pay for it. Heslow says that this is a mistake. What's covered by the state or what's covered by insurance companies are general events that are costly, that are impossible to predict, that are outside of an individual's control. Um, often these don't include diseases, and often uh, many things that are diseases are not covered by, uh, by the state or by insurance. So errors in the eye that cause vision problems are clearly diseases, but they're usually very mild diseases, and they're relatively cheap to fix.
the state isn't going to pay for your for your eyeglasses. Uh, so a third option is that diseases grant special rights. For instance, if you're diseased, then you may be granted the right not to work. Um, you can be supported by the state. The state can help you through the disease. But Heslow says again, um, no, this is just wrong. Uh, so what grants special rights are not diseases, but rather the discomforts and the disabilities associated with diseases. Um, I mean, that's the case for any right that you might suggest a disease confers. If you think that disease confers some special sort of right, if you analyse it more carefully, you'll see that what actually confers the right are the, the problems and discomforts associated with the disease. Many diseases don't confer any special rights. For instance, mild colds. A cold is clearly a disease, but generally most people are expected to continue as normal because it's, it's just not that much of a problem. It's not a, it doesn't matter, really, if you, if you have a cold, at least in the vast majority of cases. Um, conversely, many things that are not diseases do confer rights, special rights. We grant special rights to old people, but old age isn't a disease. The reason why old people get special rights is just because of the, the general decline in function that's associated with old age. Again, though, that's, I mean, it's not a disease, right? Old, old, as, as we age, you know, an 80-year-old person is not going to be able to run around like a 40-year-old person, um, or a 40-year-old 40 40 person isn't, isn't going to be quite as good as a 20-year-old. Um, the, the point is that just as, as we age, the body gets sort of general wear and tear. Um, that's not a disease, that's just the sort of normal progression of, of life. Okay, a fourth option is that disease can free you of moral responsibility and criminal liability. Um, well, this, I think this really only works in the context of mental diseases, mental illnesses. People who commit criminal actions uh, are, are held to be not responsible for them if they have a mental disease. Uh, they will not be. They will, they will sort of go into institutions, medical institutions, psychiatric institutions, rather than the the criminal system. Now, Heslow says the the reason why. Uh, so Heslow points out the reason why being mentally ill is um, it, it, it matters here is that mental illness is seen as diminishing a person's um, sort of ability to control their own actions. Um, it, it it diminishes a person's responsibility. And that just means that criminal punishment or the threat of criminal punishment can't be expected to have any effect on them. So the line here is not really between uh, the mentally diseased and the mentally healthy. It's between those who are likely to be reformed by prison and those who are more likely to be reformed by other kinds of institutions. Mental illness is a problem when it removes a person's capacity for comprehending their actions. Now, many mental illnesses do no such thing. Uh, let's say you've got depression and you... I know you think it will make you feel better if you rob a bank. Well, you're probably not going to get let off the hook in that case. Um, you just go to prison. Uh, also, we uh, many mentally healthy people are seen as having um, diminished responsibility. Children, right? We exempt children from adult punishment. The reason is that we take children to have less control, less capacity for understanding the consequences of their actions. So what matters to criminal punishment is the ability to comprehend consequences it has nothing to do with disease. So those are the four possible justifications that Heslow consider considers, and he emphasises these points with an analogy to somebody taking their car to a garage because they're not happy with its acceleration. Uh, so the, the mechanic examines the car thoroughly, and he says, uh, look, there's absolutely nothing wrong. The acceleration isn't supposed to be faster. Uh, now, the customer responds, well, my friend's car has much better acceleration, so there must be something wrong. Uh, the mechanic says, nope, there's no fault. There are individual variations between every car. Your car is just differently ad adjusted. There's not actually anything wrong with it, it's just different. The customer's now getting a bit annoyed. He says, well, you know, clearly things aren't as good as they could be, so I want it fixed. Um, but the mechanic says, you know, there's, there's nothing to fix. There's nothing, there's nothing wrong with the acceleration. It's, it, everything is fine. So let's say um, you know, we want to intervene and help them sort out this disagreement. So along comes uh, a third person, the philosopher, who says, well, clearly the problem here is that there's a confusion about the notion of mechanical fault. And what we need to do is sit down and do some conceptual analysis to figure out exactly what we mean when we talk about mechanical faults, um, you know, and, and, and when something counts as a mechanical fault. And that will tell us whether the car is faulty or whether it isn't faulty. Uh, 
So that's, that's the philosopher. But now imagine a fourth person comes along, the Philistine. And the Philistine just turns to the mechanic and says, look, this is all silly. Right? The important questions are, can you do anything to improve the acceleration? And if so, are there any reasons not to do it? Whether or not there's anything wrong with the car, whether there's anything defective with the car, whether it has a fault or a flaw, that's all beside the point. You have a customer who wants something doing to their car, you have uh, you have to discuss the pros and cons, but you know, the argument about whether or not it counts as a fault is just completely sterile. It just doesn't matter whether or not uh, the, you know his lower acceleration is or is not a fault. Okay, that's completely irrelevant. So Heslow thinks that we're in basically the same position with regard to health and disease. Worrying about what counts as a disease is at best a waste of time and possibly even um, it causes problems, it, it possibly introduces confusions. What matters is that we have various kinds of specialists who deal with the human body and who can make all sorts of adjustments to it. The only question you ever need to ask is, uh, you know, given my goals, what are the benefits and the costs of this adjustment? But disease, uh, Hessler thinks, it just doesn't matter. So that's kind of quite a quite a challenging um, position there. I um, I think it's you know there's there's it's it's fairly plausible. I think um, I wouldn't say I buy it myself yet, but um, that's that's certainly an, an interesting view. Um, we just don't need a concept of disease. We should we could at least do away with it, and we should stop worrying about it. So um, with that, that's. That's the end of this uh, this little series. Um, well, not really a series. Two videos. But I hope you found that interesting. Um, goodbye.